God today, Lord. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, welcome to Angelus Temple Church of the Dream Center. I'm Alexa. I'm the youth and young adults pastor here at Angelus Temple. And I'm Kirk. I'm a second-year student in the Dream Center Leadership hey. School. Yes, amen. Y'all, we're so excited y'all are here. It's a blessing to be in church. Y'all, we want to get you connected, too. If you guys are new, if you're a first-timer, we have a Next Steps booth literally right outside yeah. across from the cafe. We want to meet with you. Church is better when you're connected. So y'all come see us. We want to see you there. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of connection, we have a brand new Next Gen Connect booth in the courtyard. Uh, so excited. We want to connect with youth, young adults, anyone that you're here. We want to connect with you. And something that's not new that we do every single service here at Angelus Temple is we get to hear the amazing work of the ministry going on at the Dream Center uh, that we have just a block down the street um, of a 15-story hospital building where we have miracles happening literally every single day day. And today we're hearing a miracle story from a person in our transitions program, our third year program. Welcome Kevin Sheridan. Hello church. How are we doing tonight? Let's give a shout out to Jesus before I start. Um, I've been, I'm in transitions right now. I've been at the Dream Center for a little over three years. Um, a little bit about my, my backstory is um, I have been in prison. I have been homeless. I've been a drug addict for so, so many years where my family just didn't know what to do with me. And while I was in the hole of L.A. County Jail, um, the Dream Center would, was the only person that was sending me letters, and they would hit me there. So um, while I was in uh, uh, prison, they had a COVID season, so I wasn't able to get in. But I promised God while I was in prison that I was going to make it to this place, and I, I did. As soon as I discharged, I came to the discipleship on parole, and I discharged... I discharged from parole in the discipleship program, and I, there's more to it. I discharged from my parole number in discipleship, in the, the Connections program. I graduated that place, and then I went to Connections, and in Connections, way towards the end, I got my GED. After getting my AGED and while I was in Connections, I also promised uh, God that I was going to help people in recovery. So as soon as I got my GED, I went straight to uh, a recovery place. It's secular, um, but you guys better believe that I underhandedly feed the name of Jesus to these people. So, so, so since I have went from discipleship to connections, to transitions. I'm three years plus at the Dream Center. I've grafted myself to a community that is so, so good to me. Everyone here in this church has blessed me in my life. Any struggles that I have, God put people on this earth to help one another. And I believe that's why we have thumbs on our hands so we could reach out and touch one another. And I, I have used that to full extent. Anytime I have a prayer petition to God, he puts people in front of me. Sometimes he doesn't answer my prayers immediately, but I have people there that are designed to help one another. This is our point and purpose in life. And I wholeheartedly believe that. So, so working in the job that I'm in now, I'm able to give back. And I'm able to do that 12-step of telling people that I've been in my position, that I've been in your shoes, and I can help you out. And, and through the discipleship, I have gained a, a voice of ministry. I'm able to, to talk to people with comfort, and I'm able to just express myself in a, in a way of love that I've never, ever, ever known before. And in the program, I have continued to restore a relationship with my son. He's eight years old. I've restored the relationship with my family, and I've learned to love unconditionally. I've learned to love. I love people so, so much. And I've gained a different change and perspective in my heart because I decided to give God a chance. Rather than doing things on my own, I submitted to Christ the day I walked into that door. I have three years plus of sobriety, and I thank it. I thank everyone in this church for helping me through the steps. 
There are trials, guys. Life gets uncomfortable. It gets real lifey. But with each other's help, and God, of course, first, we can get through this thing. That's what I got. Kevin Sheridan. Thank you, guys. Hey, turn to the person next to you as you're seated and say, God's still in the encouragement business, you know? Man. Wasn't that encouraging? Way to go, Kevin. That was encouraging. I'm going to invite the ushers forward. We're going to receive the offering right now. I just want to say, um, my, I have two dogs, and our dogs mated. That's what they do, right? And, and I should have got one of them fixed, and I didn't. And, uh, and it's awesome. We have 14 puppies at our house. <laughs> so the moral of that story is learn from me what not to do. <laughs> learn from other people's mistakes, right? Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, you guys can come up. I can pray the spirit of multiplication all over you today. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, I was just thinking about that, and I was just thinking about how the God gives you more than enough, you know, like we were, I was praying, I was like, you know, we want some puppies, and we, you know, friends and families, and, and God gives you more than what you thought, you know what I mean? God always gives you more than what you thought. We, we had three kids, we were living in New York City at the time, and uh, we were in over our heads, and so, like so much of us in, in all of our lives, and uh, we thought, we're done. Our third, our third daughter, she's not here, and I'm, uh, uh, don't think she's watching online because she's out with the kids' building, whatever. Uh, but she was, she's full, full blast. I mean, she is that girl, man. If she's doing something, she's doing it 100%. You know what I'm saying? She's that kid that does that, you know? And after her, man, we were like, I think we're done. You know, we always said we wanted four, but we're, I think we're done. And what, you know, uh, I have a problem with that. I'm going to say this. I, I didn't get fixed. Uh, <laughs> We have a problem. We have a problem here with, with, with doing responsibility in our family. Uh, and, uh, and what do you know? Caleb came along, our fourth, you know? And uh, it was interesting. Uh, I remember when, we, when Caleb came, I remember thinking, we have two girls, two boys, and I remember thinking when that came, it was a fulfillment of something I said I wanted to do. We said that we wanted, but life came around and tried to derail us from what we thought God wanted. Isn't that the way in our lives, though? Isn't that the way in our lives? We make these plans. We set life in, in a certain way, and we say, this is what we're going to do. And then life begins to push on us, right? And then we relent from what we said we wanted to do. And I think in the area of generosity, everyone I ever talk to, you know what they want to be? They want to be generous. Every person wants to be generous. We all want to be generous. We all want to leave a legacy. We all want to do something bigger than ourselves. We all want to be those people that, that like have the big you know, open home and everybody can come and eat. And we all kind of want to be that. Even if we're introverted, there's a piece of us that wants to be generous. And especially as God's kids, we want to be the most generous people on the planet. But what happens? Times get tough. Things around us begin to shift. And it's in times like that that the Lord is faithful to complete what's in our heart. He says, I'll complete what I started in you. He'll complete the work that he started in all of us. And so every time we have an opportunity to, to, to worship or to give, let's do our very, very best. Not because we're doing it for somebody. I love the testimony, but let's not give just because we heard a great testimony. Let's give because we serve a great God. Amen? Let's give out of the big abundance of our heart. So Lord, we thank you today that we get to give out of the overflow of our hearts. God, we know that, Lord, it, the it fruit of the gift, Lord, is all around us. It's in changed lives. We see that. But Lord, the most important thing, give us a heart for generosity so that we give not out of compulsion or not because we've been convinced by some great video or something else. Let us give because your, your, your Holy Spirit is alive in our hearts. Help us through your spirit to become more and more generous every single day. And we give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen, amen. There's many ways you can give. You can follow on the screen. You can give the app or you can give on the way out or one of the ushers is going to pass around and you can give that way. Let's do our very best. Springing up from dust, you're alive in us. In every word we sing, heaven is coming to earth. The valleys flow with streams, dry bones begin. Something new in me. Heaven is coming to earth, springing up from dust. You're alive in us, in every word we see. Heaven is coming to earth, the valleys flow with streams. Dry bones begin to sing. There's something new in me. Heaven is coming to earth. 
thank you again for the opportunity we had to give, Lord. And we, Lord, we just thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, Pastor Matthew is in Salt Lake City, Utah today, and he's preaching multiple services. He's finally finishing the gauntlet that is Awake Church, Awaken Church down in San Diego. He's been at every single campus, and they've been super generous um, to us in the Dream Center here in Angels oh, yes, Temple, and uh, we're super, super excited, and so you have to put up with me this morning, so hopefully it'll be all right. We're going to, uh, thanks, Mom. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to speak on a subject I'm very passionate about. Um, it would be better to speak on that than something I'm not passionate about, but I'm, I'm, there's, there's certain things in my heart lately. There's, there was two things I wrestled with in this message. I wrestled with two different topics. There's two things that God's been dealing with me on. Uh, I'm, I'm working on this, this book I've been working on for 20 years. Uh, there's no pages written at all. Um, <laughs> and it's on discipleship. It's been the story of my life for 20 plus years. And, and the two topics that Lord's been working me on is worldliness and repentance. And... Um, and when I said those words, you responded the way I thought, whoa, whoa, okay, buckle up, you know? Um, and it's interesting because those things are usually, when I've, uh, as I've unpacked those, as I've studied those, as I've distilled those, they're like most things with God, they're so much different than what you really think. And so I land, the coin landed on repentance today. I'm gonna speak to you about a call to repentance. I'm gonna talk to you about repentance. You know, that's an ancient word that we don't use anymore. It's a word like discipleship that's just really kind of antiquated and no one really knows about it. And when we talk about it, to be truthful, when we, when we say that word, um, all across this room, a different levels of emotions begin to rise in you when I've said that word, if you've had any background in church. If you're not, then you're like naive and you're like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. Okay, that's a cool word. What does this mean? Uh, but if you've been in church, then you're loaded down with what repentance really is. You're already loaded down with your assumptions about like, okay, what, what take is this guy gonna go on this thing? Is he gonna like bludgeon us to get death about all our mistakes? Like where is he going with this idea of retent, repentance? Uh, let me start, let me back up and ask you a question I think is really pertinent for all of us to really wrestle with in our culture today. Uh, let me say it to you this way. Let me, let me go light and then I'll go heavy, right? Let me go light roast and then we'll go dark roast, right? Uh, have you ever changed your mind about anything, Right? It sounds easy, right? You're like, yeah, sure you have, right? There's a few things in my life that I've changed my mind about. Uh, one, I, I'm, I'm still waiting on one. There's one in my pocket that I'm still waiting on. I'll tell you that one in a second. Uh, well, let me tell you now, because I've been up with 14 puppies, so I don't forget. Uh, tomatoes, right? I'm waiting on the day that tomatoes are good to me. You know what I mean? Like, they're still not there. Mayonnaise and tomatoes are still on that list, the, the naughty list for me, right? Uh, I've, I've evolved to be able to handle spread at in and out amen. I can do that now, right? I'm mature enough in my manhood to actually enjoy spread, right? When I thought, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I acted like a child. But as I become a man, I put away childish things, and I can now have spread on my, on my burger. Used to be ketchup, mustard, pickle only, and don't touch it with the mayonnaise, and that's why I hated Wendy's for so long. Because they put that dreaded mayonnaise on all their burgers. But I, I still, I haven't been able to evolve. But some things I have evolved, I've changed my mind about. One is coffee. When I was younger, coffee was gross, it was awful. Then about six months into discipleship and I had to do night security. <laughs> Feeling much like I do this morning, actually. I was exhausted and I had, we had this guy by the name, I, he, he not watching it either, but Reese, if you're watching, cool. There was a guy by the name of Reese and Reese uh, knew how to make coffee, if you know what I'm saying. Like, he made coffee coffee, right? I thought I made coffee, but I didn't make coffee because mine didn't look like motor oil, right? <laughs> like, the coffee that these guys would make in discipleship was like, I mean, they would go down, we would go to the dollar store, we all working off nickels, rubbing nickels together, and we'd have a little pass, you know, every so often, you know, because we were there for so long. We'd give up to walk down to the, uh, this is forever ago, you're like, passes. Yeah, we'd go down to the 99 cent store and we'd get coffee, this cheap, the cheapest coffee, Folgers or something that's in our cup or whatever, you know, the most cheap brand of coffee you could possibly get. Uh, all of my friends that are coffee snobs, I see some of you out there, and you're cringing in your soul, right, because it's not pour over. It's not from Ethiopia, you know. It's not blooming, there's no blooming, there's no gooseneck, it's, I get it, you know. It's, it, but it, they would pack the coffee so much that the, they could almost not shut the Mr. Coffee Maker, you know what I mean, like, and then they would make the coffee, and then 
and this is sacrilegious, they would pour the coffee back into the pot and go a second time around. Needs to say, man, I was, I felt like Willy Wonka that night, man. I walk around like, <laughs> won't you view me to paradise? Come on, just around and view it. I mean, I'm walking around like, where the bus parking lot, Lord. Huh? You guys stop doing that and get out of the buses. I mean, like, you know, like the normal things you see at the Dream Center. Uh, the people that knew what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. Um, you find the craziest things at the Dream Center, and they all do it at night. Right? The Lord said it, the, Satan works at night, right? But I changed my mind about coffee, okay? I love coffee now, and I didn't at the time. I've changed my mind about country music, okay? I grew up despising country music. Like, and I grew up in Alabama, guys. I grew up in Alabama. I mean, Roper boots, I'm just in hats with the fish hook in it, and the, hey, man, we got our boots, and we're going to re rodeo, and you know what I mean? Like, full-on blast. Like, you had, like, you had athletes at our, and you had nerds, and then you had rodeo people, right? That was kind of the scope in our, in our, in our high school growing up. And I remember I didn't go with that crowd, and I, I listened to a lot of R&B and rap and things like that, and alternative music. And, yeah, that's kind of where I, I kind, of, kind of go down that lane. I played a lot of sports, so that kind of fit in the vein of where I was going. But as I've gotten older, I don't know what it is. Now, now listen, I'm not proficient. I can't tell you the name of any of the artists. I don't own any albums. Not that you would even do that now because you stream. But there's no playlist on any of my streaming services that have a country playlist. But when my daughter plays it, I don't hate it, <laughs> which is crazy, right? I mean, I just, I loathed it. I despised it. I mean, oh my gosh, country is the worst. And now I kind of like it, and I don't know. I know I'm getting old. That's probably what it is, and it's like, you know, God is good, and everything is okay, you know, and I'm like, oh this, is, oh, this is so great for society or something, you know, so maybe that's why I like it. I've changed my mind about sleep. I mean, I've changed my mind about sleep, right? When I was young, I hated to sleep. It's boring. I'm ready to get up. I mean, right in the morning, it's like, bing, you pop up. You're like, dude, what are we doing sleeping around here? It's vacation. Let's go. How many people know that you get older and this is, I'm gonna tell you something sick. I'm, this is, uh, but I'm about to preach on repentance, so I might need to change my mind about this. I look forward to bedtime. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You know, you're like, ooh. Me and my, me and my wife are like old, the oldest couple in the world. Like, we're like, oh, I'll make some tea, and then you guys will lay down, and we'll lay down, we'll, you can put a show on that I won't watch, and I'll fall asleep. It'll be great. You know, it'll be like, it's gonna be amazing, right? It's crazy. And then that bedtime, I don't know what it is. We've we, we always been kind of night owls because of what we do. We've stayed up late, but for some reason, that clock just starts going the opposite direction. I mean, pretty soon it's going to be like 5.30 and we get back from uh, some version of a Cracker Barrel somewhere or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> and roll into bed. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with me. It's crazy. I've changed my mind about sleep. Now, each one of you have your own list, laundry list, right? And I wanted that to be fun. I wanted it to be kind of exciting. But let me kind of take that down a notch and let's talk about we for a second. Let's say this. What are the areas, right? So like, that's easy stuff. But when's the last time you, don't say out loud, don't try to be a virtuous person, be like, every day, Brad, I changed my mind every day. <laughs> when's the last time you changed your mind about something important, though? What, what areas are you talking about, Brad? Well, let me, let me give you some. Let me, let me just say it this way. What are the areas that make you uncomfortable for anyone, especially like a pastor like me, to bring up in public? Like when, when somebody that maybe gets here, like, and I'm, I'm the cringe person up front, like, don't go there, like, because we have a very diverse congregation. So somebody gets up and they start going one direction politically, I'm kind of like, okay, we got a lot of people in here and there are a lot of, not because I am ashamed of my beliefs, it's because I believe Christ loves everybody and I think that the world's a lot bigger and a lot more diverse than what we think it is. Now, I'm not talking about the Bible or Christianity. Let me make sure I'm telling you the right thing. What I'm saying is this. I've hung around some conservatives that are really good people, and I've had some conservatives that are like right wing, and they're crazy people, okay? But before you laugh too hard, I've been around a lot of people that are liberal, and they're very generous, kind people that wanna make a difference in the world. And there's some other people that are crazy people. And I've met godly people on both sides. 
People, and I'm gonna say right now, I've been, with, I've been walking with God now to a point where I don't just look at somebody and go, oh yeah, they're a Christian, they're good. No, 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 I'm talking about people, there's a difference. I'm talking about like they love Jesus. They're not Christian by a name association. They love Christ. And I've seen people all over the spectrum in that way. Now, why did I bring that up to make you uncomfortable? No, it's to say it's in those areas that I would say that as you get older and older and older, it becomes so much harder to actually change your mind about core things that are important to you. So we read the scriptures and Jesus shows up and he's like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we think, well, why don't they just repent? because they've thought that way their entire lives. Their whole life they were taught a certain thing. Their whole life they were brought up a certain way. Their whole life was about an ideological way of thinking. It was like, this is how we think as people. This is what we do. This is who we vote for. This is what we say. This is where we go. And you're indoctrinated your whole entire life, and then you get older and think, and then in our minds, I think there's a disconnect. There's a dissonance between what we think we are and what we really are. We think we are these open-minded individuals that if you give me some new information and I can see it's logical, then I'll be certain to change my mind. And yet psychology and the world around us tells us it's very different than that. Most people, the way you know where you're at is if somebody confronts you with the truth, you get angry about it. When somebody confronts me about something that's a core belief to me, typically I don't go, oh, well, I'll just change my way of thinking. That's a, great, that's a great point. Wow, I'll change it. No, we go, you know what? Man, you know what? That person, he just, he just hates everybody. And he, you know, that, that woman, she just, she just, we villainize people. Why, why do we, if you notice that, we attack people's morals and we attack their personalities and we attack them as individuals. Why? Because something they're saying is disrupting our ideological ways of thinking. And so because of that, now why is this important? It's because when we think about the word repentance, We don't root it in biblical repentance. So often we have so many weird views about repentance. I mean, repentance is, you know, when I was younger, repentance was this. It was a 180. It was, was, I was going a certain direction in sin and then I repented and so therefore I I do a 180 and I go the opposite direction. And is there change? Yes, but that's not really a great way to look at repentance. It's not really getting into the heart of what repentance is. And so therefore people make, they make these blanket promises to God that their heart is not ready to keep. Now I'm not deterring you from making promises to God even though I would say think about what you promise to God. The scriptures say that. But, when's, but the idea is like, where is the heart change? Where is God actually moving? The word repent is, is used over 100 times in scriptures, depending on what version. It's like 120 in one version, like 108 in, another, in other versions. 30 times this, if it was about sin, think about this. 30 times in the Bible, the Lord repents. Did you know over 30 times, I think it's like 39 times in the scriptures, the Lord repented? So was the Lord going towards sin and then one day was like, I'm turning away from sin and I'm going in a 180. No, God doesn't sin, God doesn't have sins, but yet the Lord repented. So what is repentance then? Because we hark on this, we, 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 we land on this over 30 times, right? And then 66 times, one for every book of the Bible, it's referring to men and women repenting. So what's this call to repentance? Well, the call to repentance really, in its essence, is a, is a call to radically change our being, change our minds, our wills, and our emotions about something. In its simplest form, the word is metanoia. It it means uh, the mind afterwards, or we might say an afterthought. The Greek word, it comes to this uh, significant, I like this way of saying it, significant changing of one's mind. It carries not only an intellectual assessment, in other words, like, aha, Rika, I've got some data, but it also affects the emotions, and it, and it, creates a visceral response that your will actually changes. In other words, I'll say it very simply, your I want begins to change to I want to serve you. Before I repented, I wanted to do what I wanted, and then all of a sudden, you did something in me, and now I wanna do what you want me to do. And I find myself doing that, and it's a deep change in my life. Uh, Years ago, Stella was 
she's not here this morning. She's sinning in Sacramento with my daughter's volleyball tournament. I said, we don't do that. We don't, we don't go to those sinful things like volleyball, all oh, that spiking and ah. We go to church. We repent of that. We go a totally different direction. Uh, years ago, Stella, had, she, had some, she, she was having some digestive stuff after her last child, and she goes and gets, and she goes to the doctor. She had to go to the hospital. She had to get him into the hospital, and she had some stuff going on, but they gave her a, um, they gave her a CAT scan. And during the CAT scan, they found an, abnorma- like an abnormality on her pancreas, right? And so, as you can imagine, it, and my wife is like, she, there's no grass growing on any stone at our house. There's never a conversation we're gonna have later, right? That's not my wife. My wife's not like, you know what, honey, we'll just talk about that tomorrow. I mean, I don't care what time, but we're gonna handle this today. It's gonna get done, and we're gonna do it right now. That's my wife, right? And I love her for it. Like, thank God, because I could be opposite that. Let, hey, let's just let this play out and see where it goes. Like, no, 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 she's gonna get it right now. We're gonna get it finished. And so she's like freaking out. She's doing research, and she goes, and she has to get an MRI. And when she goes to the MRI, it, it, it ended up being not cancerous, but it was just a little bit of an inconsistency. But this is what the doctor said. The doctor told my wife, she said, he said, he said listen, um, Mrs. Reed, what you need to do, though, is like, it is an abnormality, but every year I want you to come back and get an MRI just to make sure that nothing changes in that. And so every year she has to go back and get an MRI, and it's not, it hasn't changed, praise the Lord. But he said these words. He says, but be careful what your diet consists of and really stay away from sugar and things like that. Now, all of Stella's friends know exactly what I'm talking about. If you know my wife, she is ridiculous about her diet. It is ridiculous. It's like, you know, I, I, brownie, she's like, I can't eat the brownie. Like, she's gotten a little bit better, right, that, for that. And most people think she does it for superficial reasons. Of like, And I don't mean this in a negative way because we all want to look our best, but she's not doing it because she wants to slim down. She's doing it because when... That doctor told her that. She had a change of mind. Before, she was like, ooh, she was like, oh, man. Uh, like, like, if all the things, she's never been a huge eater, but like, if she's gonna eat something, it was always something sweet. It was always like, like chips and salsa for her and like at the table and something like a brownie or something. She'd be like, oh, chocolate. Okay, I'll eat a little bit of that. You know, that was always my wife. From that moment, she didn't struggle at all. Boom. It all left the house. I could eat a brownie Sunday in front of her. She doesn't get moved. She doesn't want any of it. She doesn't need any of it. Why? Not because she's a good person. She repented about what she thought about that in her life. She changed her mind, really changed her mind. Some of us, we have reoccurring sin in our life and we have these over and over things in our life. And if, and if I could be so ever so gentle to kind of press on you about it, I would say this. You say, well, I don't wanna do this anymore anymore. If I could gently press back on you, yeah, you do, because you do it. And I get it. There's addiction and trauma and all this stuff, and I've, we've done research and all this, and all that stuff plays into it. But at the end of the day, Jonathan Edwards, the great American evangelist, said this. At the end of the day, we sin because we desire to. At the core of our being, we, we still have that conscious decision to say, yeah. So, so Brad, what are you getting at? I'm getting at the idea that this idea of, of a call to repentance in the Bible is this ongoing revelation. The call to repentance is not a, a, just a willful decision to turn away from sin. How many people have repented in an altar and you go out and that night you do the same thing? And you keep struggling over and over and over again. And what we do as Christians is we confuse forgiveness for repentance and they're not the same thing. God says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to What? forgive you, that does not mean you repented. Now, I know that's very, like somebody I can see right now, you're like, does not compute, they're the same thing, I repented of my sins in an altar call, this does not, no, no, I'm, you gotta separate the two because repentance means you actually changed your mind, you don't want that anymore. To repent, and it doesn't mean I won't ever do that again, it just means I have now become aware that I don't look at it anymore. Paul said this, that you would become to, that you would graduate to the point where you hate what is evil and love what is good. But if we're honest with ourselves, and I have to be honest with myself, there are a lot of things that tempt me that are evil, and I don't look at them as evil, I look at them as good, but God doesn't want me to have them. Let's be honest, right? You want that relationship. You want it really bad. And you think, people are in, I don't know if God's in this. Like, 
oh, oh, I deserve this. I mean, I've had a really rough life. And you don't understand where I'm coming from. And, and what do we do? We justify it, why? So that we can get what we need, because why? Because we don't really believe that. We're trying to keep ourselves from something we think God doesn't want us to do, but we don't believe it's the best way. Are you, are you tracking with me this morning? Repentance is so amazing. Now, I'm gonna, so really, re, call to repentance is a call to have revelation given to you by God that you see things radically different. The second piece to revelation, uh, to, to, to repentance that I think is amazing is the call to repentance is also a call to return. You know, the turning away, sometimes we hear that, but we miss the essence of it. We think it's this willful, you know, pull up the bootstrap, white knuckled, like, okay, I, know, I love this thing. This thing is amazing. It's really better than God to me right now, but all right, God, I'm turning away. Here we go, new decisions. Da, 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 da. And we think that's that. No, 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 that's good decision making and that's good community, but you still yet haven't had a change of mind. It's not the turning, it's a return. There's a difference. See, the return is, it's a divine invitation to come back home that we've drifted. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each to our own way, and what happens, we drift, and the Lord in his loving kindness, he begins to invite us back to, look, repentance is an invitation. Let's come back to my path for you. You've got off the path. Let's get back on the path. You've kind of went the different direction. It's a call back home. It's a revelation, but it's also a call to return. The children of Israel, he said, listen, let's return to where I had you. Let's get back to where I need you. Let's get back to where I want you to be. God is always calling us back to restore us. It's what we call in, the, in theolog theological circles, restorate, restoration. God wants to restore you back to his best life for you. But you think about it. The, the journey of discipleship is not one that, because even this, today I'm gonna ask you to come down, we're gonna say a prayer, and in that prayer we're gonna repent, but in that prayer it's just a moment for something to happen. But think about this, you can't even really repent of all your sins because you don't even know some of the things you're doing right now are sinful until you, the Lord reveals it to you. So how could you come down and go, I repent of my sin, all of my sin, and I'm leaving right now, no more sin. You're forgiven of your sin, but you can't repent for sins that you don't even know are sin yet, the Lord hasn't even revealed it to you yet. So when you pray that God saves you and you do repent of some things, there's, in other words, there's about three or four things in that thing that you think you're laying down for the sake of Jesus. And in that, there's some repentance happening and God calls you towards salvation. But did you know your whole lifelong journey of discipleship with God is a series of repentance? I mean, it's a call. Uh, Martin Luther said that we repent daily. What is he saying? It's not groveling and hitting ourselves with sticks. It's this idea that the more I walk with him, the more I talk with him, the more I share with him, the more he shares in me, that I begin to convert and conform my life from where it used to be to where God wants it to be. That's the journey of repentance. What are some signs of biblical repentance? And then I'm gonna end on how. What are some signs? Well, one of the signs is that we'll bear fruit. I love that. We'll see something different. John, Matthew 3, John the Baptist said it this way, right? And he said, he says, he says, <laughs> he, he says that you would bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, that you would start bearing fruit that you actually have changed your mind about what's going on. People say, you know, repentance is turning away from sin and never going back. No, that's the fruit of repentance. I, I don't wanna lose you here. There's a difference between the fruit of something and the thing. The thing was a different belief, seeing it different, and the fruit of that is I don't walk that way anymore. But the walking that way anymore is not the thing, it's the thing that led to the thing. It's so important for us to get that because we spend all of our time trying to figure out how not to do something. That's good so that you don't sin. I think that's really good. Put community around you so you don't do it. But why don't we spend more time with the revelation and the return invitation to find out why am I doing it and Lord, help me to see it differently. What in your life do you need to see differently? The second one, the first one is we bear fruit. The second one is we feel godly sorrow over our sins, not the consequences of our sins. You know you're really repentant and you know you're really thinking differently when you're actually thinking about how you grieved God's heart, not that you got caught. 
You see this, even I'll use, I'll, I'll pick on pastors because that's what I am, right? You see this with pastors, they're like, they have these big falls and they're like, I'm just so broken. You're broken because you lost your church. You're not broken, you, you lost your platform. You know, you lost your importance. Now I'm stepping on my toes, but I could go right into your area too. You lost that board seat. You lost that spouse. You lost their trust. And so therefore, we're remorseful and we're, and we're sad and we're like, oh, but we're not. But it, but it doesn't get back to the thing that he goes, David said it this way, to you and you alone have I sinned. In other words, there's something there that's fractured. Finally, let's land with here. How do, we, how do we repent? Well, let me say it to you this way. It's the easiest yet impossible thing that you can do. And that's just so encouraging, right? It, it's, it, everything with the gospel is such an oxymoron. It's such a like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a paradox, right? It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, it's the easiest thing that you can't do. In other words, it only takes a moment to ask for God to forgive you. It only takes a moment to really repent, but yet without the Holy Spirit's involvement, you won't actually really repent. Romans 2, 4 says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? In other words, God's long suffered with you. He's patient with you. He's kind with you. He's led you to this point. And, we, and he, says, he says, well, no, no, no. You don't want to like presume on it and be like, well, God will always be there. And you don't want to think, oh, I can do this whenever I want. You don't want to presume on that because don't you understand? It's, it's all this time it's been God's kindness trying to get you to change your mind. And so often we don't change our mind and then we have to reap the, the, the consequences of those choices. One of my favorite books on temptation is Thomas, Thomas Brooks' book. Uh, it's, uh, he's an old Puritan back in the 1600s. He's, it's Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It doesn't that look just riveting. It's a New, Ti New York Times bestseller. And he says this, he says, in the book, he lays out all the devices that Satan used. He uses the word scandalon, this idea of a, of a trap. And he talks about, these are the devices that Satan used. He's distilled down like these 16 different devices that Satan uses to try to get lure you to, to sin. The first one is, uh, he always shows the bait and never the hook. Satan always goes, isn't this awesome? But he doesn't show you the hook that's inside of it, right? And the one that caught me, and the reason why I brought this up is he says this, he says, Satan tries, this is his, his device, he says, Satan tries to persuade the soul, sorry for the old English way it's written, Satan tries to persuade the soul that the work of repentance is an easy work, and therefore the soul need not make such a matter of sin. And he gives you two different remedies, right? Like, so he gives you the device, and he gives you a series of remedies that he, almost like a doctor prescribing it to, a, to another believer of what we can do what begin to begin to meditate on and to pray about to help overcome temptation. One of the remedies, he says, one remedy against this device of Satan is to seriously consider that repentance is a mighty work, a difficult work, a work that is above our power. So in other words, let me break it to you in, in English, simple English. He says this, Satan's gonna come to you and say this, I know you're under a lot of stress and temptation, just give in, you can always repent right afterwards. Right? We've all felt that, right? I just don't, the reason why you feel that way, everyone feels that way, by the way. Everyone feels that way. In other words, everyone gets tempted with something and you think, man, this is overwhelming right now. Ugh, you know, I'm just gonna give in to this and then I'll ask the Lord to forgive me, right? Now, the Lord is faithful to forgive you, but there's a difference between repentance and forgiveness. In other words, what you're saying is this, I'm gonna give in to this and then God will just give me revelation later. So in other words, you think repentance is an act of your will and you don't understand that it's a merger between your will and his will. It's what we call the mystery of God. In other words, God's involved in this, and we presume on it, we think that's the temptation. Just sin, and you can always repent, but there's no guarantee that you'll actually start thinking differently where you want to stop. What's the other remedy? A second remedy is this. Another remedy against Satan's device is to seriously to consider that to repent of sin is as great a work of grace as not to sin. Yet it is better to be kept from sin than to be cured of sin by repentance, as it is better for a man to be preserved from a disease than to be cured of the disease. Let me say it to you in plain English. What he's saying is this. The same grace needed to withhold yourself from 
sinning is the same grace, you're fooling yourself, it's the same grace you're gonna need and empowerment you're gonna need to repent of it. So before, this is why I know we don't think the same way. Before you think, man, I'm just overwhelmed under temptation. It's too great for me to bear. Well, guess what? How do you, the same grace you're gonna need right now is in 15 minutes, you're gonna need the same grace to ask God to help you see it differently. It's so important for you to grasp it. I know this is a little dense and I can tell some of you are like, okay, can we get to the good part, you know? But I need you to see that this is so important for your walk with God. So let me, let me say this and we're gonna land the plane on Luke 15. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke 15. Let me say this, repentance is not, it's not regret and remorse. That's not where repentance is. Repentance is not this. You, you, you have a problem and you sin and you're like, man, I'm, I feel so bad and I'm so remorseful. That's not repentance because you, that doesn't mean you change. Repentance, if you don't hear anything else what Brad said today, hear this. Repentance is revelation and return. Repentance is divine revelation from God that I actually seriously think differently now. I don't look at it the same way. Those who have been walking with the Lord for a while, you could probably say that there's a few things in your life that you would say, you know what? I no longer think innocently about that anymore. I actually know that it's actually devastating for me. You see, you're see, you seeing somebody sin or they do something they do something that hurts people around them and you ever heard them say this? Well, it's just me, it's not hurting anybody. And anybody that's old enough, right? And I'm not God, I'm not wise like God. I don't have their information. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. I have no way to ascend to where he is. But even in my peonic wisdom, I can see that that person doesn't see that they're affecting people. They're like, well, it's just my sin. I don't know why they're so up in my business. I'm not hurting anybody. Are you a father? Are you a wife? Are you a child? Are you a son? Are you a daughter? It's not affecting your family. It's not affecting your coworkers. It's not affecting those that you love. But you can't see it. Why? Because you haven't had the divine revelation. You still see in the narcissism of our sin that it's just affecting me. But yet the Lord wants to give you revelation that no, look what it's doing. And when we have that revelation, we begin to think differently. And guess what? And therefore we respond in kind and we begin to follow the way of Jesus. It's so important for us to see. Let's land the plane right here, Luke 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. I'm gonna give you the most, that I found to be the most, in one, in one section I've seen this is what repentance really looks like. The young man, the, the, uh, Jesus, and Jesus said, this is Jesus talking, he says, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of, the, of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he spent everything, severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed. Look at, look at his heart. He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. And here's that big hinge word, but. I love the Greek here, but he says, but when he came to himself, when he had the revelation." He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, listen, look, look what he does. He prepares a little speech of forgiveness, right? He prepares this little speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to the father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and he kissed him. Notice what happens. Because most of us read this wrong, and for years I've read this wrong. What I read is this. That sorry sucker spent everything he had. <laughs> right? We're in the same frame, right? We're, 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 on the, we're tracking on the same plane, right? Oh, I see how this guy works. I see his mode of operation here. Go out, squander everything, right? And then once you don't have anything anymore, it's like, oh, dad. Uh, oh, and I understand we see it that way, right? Because we're seeing things from the kid's perspective. We're not seeing it from the father's perspective. See, when the revelation 
It might be that God reveals to you a great need that you have that only he can answer. Because what the son does, what does he do? He has a revelation. Hired servants eat better than this. And then what did he do? He returned to his father. I have heard testimony after testimony. People come to the Lord for all different reasons. But what it is, it's a revelation in that moment that the Lord knows that you'll receive in that moment to get you to change your mind and to get you to return. That's what he wants for every one of you. He knows where you are. I don't know that. He knows what you've been struggling with. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you, he knows everything about you and he knows what motivates you. He knows what pushes those buttons. What is his heart wanting to do? His heart is that none should perish but everyone should come to eternal life and what does he want? He wants us to come to our senses, have a revelation and he wants us to return. Many of you here today, you're gonna have an opportunity. You're gonna have an opportunity today to say a prayer to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. And what that is, for many of you, when you gotta think, when people say that prayer every week, there are people, new people coming into the kingdom every single week when they say that prayer. And people dog that prayer, I see it all the time. They're like, man, just cause you say a prayer doesn't make you a Christian. We understand that. So if you're here today and you're a theological wizard, we understand that. So you can save your text message, dog. Okay, I know, I know I'm being harsh, but I just get so tired of theological giants that sit, the armchair theologians that sit back and don't do nothing, but they just criticize everybody. It's like, we don't need you on YouTube, homie. We're cool, dog. Like, we get it, you know what I mean? It's like, well, they don't know what I know. I've been to my mom babies for 14 years, and I know. I heard John Popper one time say, okay, go. Go to his church, dog. I know that's like, uh, Pastor, probably gonna rebuke me. <laughs> but I'm just, I get so tired of that. Why? Because listen, we understand that. We're not ignorant. We're ignorant about a lot of things, but that's not where we don't say the prayer because we think magically, you say a prayer, everybody gets saved. You think that, that's not biblical. We understand that, but you know what happens? It's as easy and as difficult at the same time. It's not a series of special classes that you have to, you don't have to go to the next steps to get saved. You have to have revelation and you gotta believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's what you need to get saved. And if you do that, then God will work on repentance and he will show you the right, right way to step every single day. Say yes to this and yes to this and no to that and no to that and he will journey with you. And I've seen people get saved in the craziest scenarios and yet they grow into these mighty women and men of God. Paul was a, Peter was a fisherman. He was an unlearned man. And yet they came to the Lord. Why? Because they had a revelation of who he is. All across this room as we stand, we're gonna, in this service, we're gonna sing a song of worship and we're gonna do two things. I'm gonna say a prayer and then we're gonna sing the song of worship. But as we sing the song of worship, this is what I want everyone to do. Because every this, 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 this includes every one of us, me most importantly. I mean, most uh, uh, more than anybody else, right? Because I don't want anybody to think I'm excluded from this. I'm the chief of all this. There's things in our life that we know the Lord's leading us to, but for whatever reason, we can't lay them down. For those who are Christians in this place, there are things that what he might call a besetting sin or habit or thought or, um, or you think in a mindset of some way and you don't wanna be, be that way anymore in your whole life and maybe you think it's your family or you think it's generational curses or anything. There, listen, sometimes we build up a generational curse like it's this huge weight, but for God, it's like a tiny little thimble that he could just he could snap in a moment. The thing you're struggling with, you think so heavy. For God, is it heavy? no. And so in this moment, this is what I want you to do. We're gonna pray a prayer, but for everyone here, say yes to Christ. But for some of you, you've been walking with this a long time. What you, all you need to pray for is this as we sing. God, reveal to me. I never knew that. I thought, I mean, what I thought about repentance was this. I say I'm sorry, and the Lord hopefully gives me the power to kind of do some things. But what I didn't do is before I tried to repent, ask the Lord for a heart that really wants to repent. Do you know God doesn't turn you away if there's things in your life that you're still wrestling with? God doesn't, you don't get kicked out of the kingdom for that. But you won't live the fruit of it until you say yes to what he's leading you into. Everything you're, with, everything you're holding back and not saying yes to, it's only, you know who it's hurting? It's hurting the Father's heart because he loves you so much. But all he wants is good for you. His path for you is good. And every time a God says, lay this down, say no to this, move into this, yes, 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 no, no, no. When he's doing that, he's not, he's not trying to 
put religious boundaries around you to make you a puppet. He's actually trying to release you into true freedom. He wants to give you the right boundaries and the right things so that you can thrive the way he created you to thrive so that you could be all that he's created you to be. And so right now as we, as we begin to sing, I want you to think, Lord, give me a heart to repent about those things that are in your mind. And secondly, let's, we're gonna say a prayer right now. And if you say, you listen to my whole message, you say, Brad, I wanna say yes to Christ. Guess what? It's the easiest thing that you do with the help of God. So if you're here today, you say, well, I don't know if I'm ready to lay everything down. The, the gospel doesn't say you have, because, because people say this, well, you gotta lay everything down and follow Jesus. Well, you hypocrite, because you're a Christian forever. You still ain't laid everything down. That makes me so angry, like, well, I laid it down 20 years ago. Then why did I see you lie the other day? Why did I see you gossip about your coworker the other day? You obviously didn't lay that down. You ain't repented about how you talk about your brother and sister yet. It's not that, it's not, and it's not that we don't want to, it's that we have to have the humility to know that God's gonna work a lot of things out in my life and I'm gonna walk with God. And so what you have to have, is, you have to have the revelation that he's the miracle worker that can change you. So all across this room that you would say, hey, you know what, Pastor Brad, I wanna invite Christ in my life because I know that I've had the revelation this morning through all your ramblings that Jesus is Lord. If that's you today, that's what you need is a public acknowledgement. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're here today and you say, I believe in Christ, I believe he is who you're saying he is, and I wanna submit my life to him and I want him to teach me his ways. Can I just see your hand this morning? Show me your hand all across this place. Say, I wanna say yes to Jesus this morning. Thank you so much for doing that. Let's just pray all together. Let's collectively pray. Say, dear God, thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross for all of my sin. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, teach me your ways. Search me, oh God, and see all the ways that you wanna teach me how to follow you and give me a heart to follow in kind. In Jesus' name, and everybody gave a loud amen. amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. First touch from heaven, it changed me forever, one prayer was enough, with fear and with trembling, through tears and repenting, I'll never forget the mercy
church, may you know today when you leave that God is 100% on your side. May you know that he is going to reveal those things to you. And may we in kind say, Lord, help us to say yes to that leading. As the Lord, as the Spirit leads us this week, let's say yes to his leading. Lord, give us a heart as a church to say yes to the things that you're laying before us, Lord. Give us the ability, Lord, even though we'll never see things fully from perspective, but God, give us a revelation. Give us new revelation of our lives so that we can walk as examples of your love and your grace and your mercy, God. It is only by your mercy and only by your grace that we get to be who you called us to be. Lord, we love you. Bless everybody here, Lord. Bless them in their homes and their businesses. Bless their children, Lord. Bless them as they go out, God. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. God bless you, Angelus Temple. We'll see you Thursday night. It's gonna be a